very happy to welcome back to Forward Guidance, Michael Erickson, President and CEO of the Chicago Federal Home Loan Bank, and Dan Siciliano, Chair of the Council of Federal Home Loan Bank and incoming Chair of the Board of the San Francisco Federal Home Loan Bank. Gentlemen, thank you so much. Great, great to have you here. Dan, congratulations on the incoming role. We were just saying that, you know, is, is the goal for 2024 for this San Francisco region to be better than 2023, given the, the uh, you know, banking issues that were on the, the, the West Coast in, in 2023? Or is that a not, a not sufficiently ambitious goal, given that 2023 was, you know, had a lot of issues? It, admittedly, it's a low bar uh, in many cases for any region's uh, banking scenario is that 2024 will hopefully be better than 2023. But yeah, clearly so. Isn't that everyone's goal for the next year to do better than the prior year? But I think one of the things uh, that we'll see is uh, improved uh, transparency and probably all things equal in, in our region, uh, a little bit more uh, stability than we've even had these last six months. First, I just want to start off with the sort of overall health of the banking system and of the uh, you know, federal home loan bank system. And I, I should say for our viewers, the federal home loan bank system, much less known and understood than the Federal Reserve, but it plays a huge role in the commercial banking system in terms of funding funding banks, which are called advances. So yeah, Dan, Dan first, and then, and then you, Michael, just overall general comments on health of the banking system and the federal home loan banking system. On in early December, Monday, December 4th, whereas I believe we recorded our you know, prior conversation uh, at a time of much greater uncertainty. Sure, I'll, I'll let Michael expand on kind of the pattern and the pacing of the advances and kind of the activity that's going on and have him draw some conclusions about banking. Maybe for people who haven't paid a lot of attention to the federal home loan bank system, I'll just do a you know, 30 second overview and kind of where we fit in the narrative these days compared to six months ago or six years ago. As you mentioned, there is some function that feels and looks similar to the Federal Reserve, but we are different in that the federal home loan bank system is a system of banks, essentially banks for banks, but not just banks, but credit unions, other financial institutions. And though we are regulated and, and appropriately so closely regulated by the FHFA, we are not ourselves a federal entity. It's actually a gathering of private capital. And we, each of the 11 banks operate as essentially co-ops and we are, you know, federally chartered, you know, supervised by the FHFA, but these co-ops run and we borrow through consolidated function. You know, we borrow funds by issuing bonds at the, you know, global level and we do it through a particular unified system. And then we take that capital and we advance it to our members, we call them advances, and we use as collateral mortgage-related assets. And, and so that's ongoing. Those 11 districts, for example, San Francisco's California, Nevada, Arizona, an exciting time for uh, California uh, this year in terms of some of our institutions. But that function is why I think it makes sense to ask, hey, what's the scenario look like these days as opposed to six months ago? Because we're pretty close to the ground, right? Even though this is all private capital and we are a GSE, you know, what we advance and the pattern of those advances, you know, whether the advances are going up or going down, it says a lot about the banking and financial institutions in the country. And as importantly, we don't just have, you know, you know, small banks or big banks, we have a very wide cross section. And that includes, to a certain extent, CDFIs, it includes insurance companies, but the bulk of our members tend to be banks and credit unions. Some of them are small community banks, some are medium sized regional banks. And of course, we have some very large mega banks. And so, so that's where we sit in the ecosystem. That's what we do. Michael, of course, is the CEO of the Chicago Bank, which kind of has an important footprint. And maybe he can comment on the, hey, what are the patterns have been recently? What are, what are our members doing? Are they taking more advances, fewer advances? What's that look like? Yeah, it, 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 certainly. And, and Jack, in, in regards to the, the strength of the financial system, I, I would say that the federal home loan banks are really in a position of strength. We were in a position of strength back in March of, of this year during the during the banking crisis that we had seen. We're certainly in a in a area of financial strength as we sit currently. All eleven federal home loan banks are well capitalized. We're well positioned to serve and meet the liquidity needs of our members in our district. So we're we're really uh, financially strong. The uh, what we're seeing in the the banking sector more broadly, though, um, is one, the, the loan demands in a lot of places have started to drop off. And so our depository institutions are seeing less loan demand. 
be it consumer, commercial, et cetera, that's, that's dropping off from where we had seen the low demand back in 2022, especially as interest rates have increased, we would expect that to occur. And that's certainly playing out from, from a loan demand perspective on our members' balance sheets. The other thing that we've seen is the deposit outflows have stabilized uh, by and large. And so we're not seeing that large outflow that we had seen back in March of, of this year. So that's also a positive. On the credit side, it, I think you do, you're starting to see on the, on just consumer loans and other things, just more delinquencies picking up. And so that's a harbinger of, of probably more credit losses that we could potentially see from depository member institutions coming into 2024. But overall, I think the, the strength of the system is, is certainly well intact and we're here to serve our members in the future. So you said the strength of the federal home loan banks is, you know, a financial condition is strong. I would you know, say for our audience that, you know, it, it is not a government entity, Dan, as you reminded us, but it does have an implicit guarantee of the U.S. government, similar to, you know, Dan can correct me on the legal difference, if there is a difference, but you know, uh, Fannie Mae, Ginny Mae, so federal home loan banks can issue bonds at quite a low rate, you know, some some amount of basis points above what a, the U.S. government can issue via treasuries, and then loan those back to member banks, you know, who are commercial banks and other institutions, in the form of advances. So, whereas commercial banks can issue uh, can, can enter struggles, you know, a a, a entity that it has a government association encountering uh, financial difficulties, it's fundamentally different from a commercial bank uh, encountering difficulties. So uh, and so you, t- you talked about the fin- strength of the federal home loan bank system. What about, Michael, the strength of the member banks? You said waning loan demand. Was that for the loans that they make to their clients? Or, or were you talking about advanced demands, i.e. their yeah, demand so, for your money? This is, yeah, thanks for the bringing that up. For Just to clarify, it's, it's loan, loans that they are making to their customer base. And so that's part of, that's their core business is, is making loans. And what you're, we're seeing is they're taking steps to manage their credit risk exposure and, and doing other things to tighten their credit standards. When they tighten their credit standards, they are doing less lending to other, other borrowers, be it co- consumers, being other small businesses, agricultural lending, et cetera. They're pulling back on, on the lending that they're doing. And so that just impacts then the the growth in the economy and everything else. So that's what we're seeing is their loan demand dropping off. Certainly from advances, what we've seen from from March, we certainly were at a peak of of advances and advances activity. What we've seen now is as loan demands have dropped off, as the deposit base started to stabilize, the advances that had been taken out back in March and were at all time highs, those have been paying down. So the level of advances outstanding across the federal home loan banks have also come down from the height of the crisis back in March of this past year. Right. And we we're talking about advances. That's what the federal home loan bank lends to its member banks. It also issues bonds to the general public. In terms of tracking it, I believe, you know, for a civilian such as myself, uh, the data on FH, FHLB advances that are released to the public is quite laggy. For I'm on, on you know uh, the St. Louis Fed for Fred website, and I think the figure of uh, 855 billion is as of the end of June 30th, so you know Q2, which is extremely laggy. If someone who's not in the FHLB system wanted to follow this up, I think they could follow the issuances and, and auctions of individual federal home banks, the bonds that they are selling, and I presume you know if, if you're if a federal home loan bank is selling a ton of bonds, they're not just you know, going to squirrel that away and do nothing with it. They probably, it's probably to, to uh, sort of feed the fire of the need for advances. So I'm sure you know, th- those two are very correlated, although they're not the same. So, would, would, so Michael, you're saying that the trend of FHLB advances peaking in the, the middle of, of Q2, March or April, May, and then declining throughout the summer, that trend has continued for, for at least the federal home loan bank of Chicago. Yeah, it, it, the, the trend has continued. So advanced levels have, have come down in general. And also the funding, the funding levels certainly have come down as well. But 
funding is dependent upon a number of needs on the balance sheet as well. So advances is one component of that. There's other uh, reasons why federal home loan banks are issuing debt in the marketplace, but by and large advances being the core mission of our, of our institutions, that drives a lot of the issuance activity that we see. And so as that has come down, the issuance levels have come down as well. And Jack, it's worth saying, and and Michael, call me on this. If I don't get this exactly right, I might get a regional difference here. But you know, the federal home loan banks, when we say they're in good health, one of the indicators I think that anyone can observe is that they expand and contract in, you know, in synchronicity with the needs of their members. In other words, it isn't all that unusual for advances to grow and then to shrink back after a quarter or two and then to grow again. Now, of course, 2023 was somewhat extraordinary, but you know, by not as much of a quantum as you would think. I, I, I think one of the things that we've been trying to point out as people appropriately pay more attention to the system is that you know, for 90 years, it's been working really well and it has had many cycles of you know modest to extraordinary increase of advances that then contract over time. In fact, that's kind of one of the main points of our functions is that we are available for intermediate and short-term liquidity for our you know member banks. And and by the way, you're exactly right on the GSE structure. I tend to tongue in cheek say, yeah, yeah, but one one additional point is yeah, you know, we've never had a dollar loss in the system, and it's actually hard to tease out. And if any academic out there wants to make a career on this, please happily reach out to me. It's just my last name at stanford.edu. I'm happy to point you in the right direction. The question is, hey, how much benefit do we really get on the global markets? How much is that in terms of, you know, the few basis points above treasuries that we're getting? How much is that is because the system design, lots of layers of redundancy, really well capitalized federal home loan banks, you know, no history of dollar loss versus how much of that is the GSE implied guarantee. And it's really hard to know. There's obviously some specific value to the GSC implied guarantee, but I don't know about you, but if magically the federal home loan bank system were teleported into a different dimension and simply disappeared and the federal government suddenly had to face the choice of covering that, would Congress pass a bill to you know, allow a one point something trillion dollar coverage? I don't know, right? And I would say that the global bond market Certainly smarter than I am, and and their responsiveness to the current environment says that they have really good faith in the federal home loan bank systems, right? Like as you as you follow those issuances. By the way, if people want to follow the banks more closely, we are SEC registrants, right? Mm-hmm. So mm-hmm. we are we're filing quarterly. There's a consolidated you know filing as well. There's there's a lot of stuff out there, and I think it is worth you know paying attention to. Yes, and I think the Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac they they also file with the SEC, even though there's no Fannie Mae stock. Although there is, but it's I don't really know. Yeah, and again, they're both all of these organizations are supervised by the FHFA, but of course Fannie and Freddie, and this is a really important distinction in my opinion, are in conservatorship, right? Like they blew up, nearly took down the global economy, took us to the brink, and you know now they are being appropriately all but run by, right, the regulatory agency. During that same time, the federal home loan bank system did not take us to a brink, to the brink. They instead advanced a lot of capital to otherwise strong, you know, institutions who then survived the great, you know, financial crisis and, you know, lived to fight another day. And hand in hand with all those regulators, the, you know, Fed, as well as the FDIC and others, the federal home loan bank system, again, if you go back and look at the history, Obviously, advances went up and up and up, and then moderated down, went up a little more, went down. So, yeah, it's a it's a tale of a really, in my opinion, a very dynamic organization that, again, it's advancing, you know, almost all the time on the clear credit worthiness of our institutions, credit unions or banks. And then, of course, we secure it with this collateral, which, you know, the federal home loan bank system is arguably the best you know, the best in the world at assessing that collateral, understanding it, you know, appropriately giving haircuts. And so the the concerns moving forward, and maybe there's a transition maybe a little bit to what the system, you know, recommendations are. I don't think anyone is particularly saying that there's active anxiety about the federal home loan banks themselves. That really almost never comes up. Like the the, the notion of us running into trouble, we kind of a funny joke, which is by the time the federal home loan banks themselves somehow 
blow through their tremendous amounts of capital, don't get the collateral right. By the time that happens, you know, you and I, Jack, are like running for a different border. Like, you know, it's gone really, really wrong. So that's not really what's in play. I think one of the questions that has come up is what role do we play as very strong institutions who have capital to lend? What do we play? What role do we play when there is stress in the system? Right. When there when there are you know members that went from very, very strong to less strong, like what what is it that we should be doing at that moment? It's not so much a question about will we be OK? I, I don't think we should ever take that for granted. But that is way down on the list of everyone's concerns. The question is, what do we do with our members when they are a little less than OK? And I think that's one of the big policy debates that's coming up. Just to add one thing with what Dan is saying, just for your listeners, the, what makes the Federal Home Loan Banks unique is that we have a self-capitalizing nature of, of the balance sheet itself. And so when Dan is talking about the banks expand and contract, we can do that because the advances of our members are, are self-capitalized by our member institutions as they borrow. They're buying capital stock. So that helps to allow the balance sheet to expand and contract. And it's also a good risk management tool as well. So just to provide more clarity. Sorry, Jack, I'll turn it back to you. Hey, everyone, we're about to get back in the action. But before we do, let me give you a lowdown on what's been brewing at Blockworks. Come March next year in the heart of London, we're bringing together hundreds of the world's heavyweight asset managers. I'm talking about the big hitters, fund managers, allocators, payment providers, and the major high frequency traders. They'll all be converging at Digital Asset Summit London, the mother of all digitally focused conferences in the institutional space. If you're curious about what the big money is up to in the digital asset scene, this is the event for you. We're diving deep into the intersection of macroeconomics and crypto, dissecting where we're at at the market cycle, and we'll be getting into the nitty gritty of real world assets. So think stable coins and on-chain treasuries, it's all in the mix. I'm gonna be there and so are the forward guide superstars. Michael Howell is gonna be there. There's a rumor that Joseph Wang is going to be there. I don't know who started that rumor, but people are saying that. We're also getting into the minds of allocators. So you get a front row seat to what the big crypto money managers are cooking up these days. And because you're a dedicated Forward Guidance listener, here's an exclusive treat. Use code FG20 to get 20% off. Just hit that link at the end of this episode. So gear up because I'm looking forward to seeing you in sunny London town come March. Thanks. Let's get back to the interview. Yeah, I would say a federal home loan bank, a federal home loan bank sort of going down. It's a, it's in between, it's less preposterous than the Federal Reserve going down because the Federal Reserve re- truly can and does print money, whereas the Federal Home Loan Bank funds itself by issuing bonds that are treated by the market, as you say, Dan, in a you know, very similar nature to the, to the Treasury. But, but Dan, I know Fannie Mae went under, it had the government guarantee, and that, that's kind of you know, why it went into conservatorship. The government took it over so that you know, investors around the globe, Chinese investors, Japanese investors who bought Fannie Mae debt, they would still be sort of made whole. But I know the reason Fannie Mae, they had credit issues of they owned a lot of subprime mortgage bonds. Can you talk about how the Federal Home Loan Bank systems handle credit issues, given that most of its uh, assets are advances to banks, which have a credit risk, but they are securitized by mortgage-backed securities and, and, and home loans. So especially they, they have a credit risk exposure to those assets. In other words, what if a, uh, a, a loan that a, a mortgage loan goes bad and that is what is backing the federal home loan bank system? How does the federal home loan bank system you know, be made whole given that you, it, is, it is said that uh, no federal home loan bank has ever lost a dollar um, in terms of lending? So I'm going to let Michael answer the technical parts of that because it is, in fact, a fairly technical process that has been refined over the last several decades. And the federal home loan banks, each bank has a modestly different treatment, but by and large, we we behave the same way. But I do want to answer one big picture question, which is, again, when there's an offering in the global bond market by what we call our Office of Finance, it's the centralized conduit through which all the 11 banks make their offerings, you know, those buyers of that debt, what are they thinking? Are they thinking, oh, I wouldn't buy this unless there was a GSC guarantee? Or are they thinking, hey, this would be something I'd probably buy and I feel even better because there's a GSC guarantee? And, and I do think that's one of the conversations that's going to be ongoing in the next six to 18 months as we work through the FHFA report 
it is it is clearly different from when like Fannie and Freddie, it, when they were publicly traded entities, you had this conduit to the shareholder, you had all of these incentives, right, to potentially take risks and to lean on the GSE status. In our scenario, Michael just referenced this self-capitalizing method, right? That means that every member, you know, small community bank, big mega bank, you know, credit union who participates as a member has their resources, their capital locked up inside our bank. And if they want to expand their advances, they're going to have to put even more capital in. And so it's a very different incentive structure. And I would posit that there is value to the GSE, but it is not the kind of thing where a potential bond buyer shows up and says, hey, if you didn't have this stamp, I wouldn't be buying. And so I think we're going to explore that as time moves forward. And again, I don't know how much the global bond market puts in terms of emphasis on a GSE designation in an environment in which, you know, our own Congress almost defaulted, you know, on our own sovereign debt, right? Like, I, I'm just not sure what people are thinking about how great the GSE thing is. I think what they are looking at is how in the world do we do what you just asked, Jack, which is, all right, we do all these advances and we get this collateral. I mean, how safe is that really? And and Michael can answer that better than pretty much anyone on the planet. So I'll shut up. I don't know if I don't know if I can answer it better than anyone on the planet, but in general, Jack, the each of the federal home loan banks have robust credit practices in place to manage the the credit risk associated with lending to to uh, member institutions. So not only are we evaluating the members themselves, when members pledge collateral to us, we have different standards in place for the collateral being pledged. So to the extent that we have a blanket lien on the collateral, the collateral is on a listing basis or the collateral is delivered to the Federal Home Loan Bank. Each of those cases provide us protections to manage the risk of loss. The collateral that's being pledged has to be performing based collateral we also evaluate the characteristics of the collateral itself and provide a a value to that collateral and we also look at other means of which to liquidate the collateral if we had to take possession of it and that would apply a haircut on top of the collateral that were that's being pledged to us all of these factors play into managing the risk exposure credit risk exposure from lending to the member institution in addition to that the members are also pledging it as as they borrow from the bank they're they're setting aside capital stock for that as well so all of those components together function as a buffer to protect the federal home loan banks in case there is a, a loss on the advances itself so that just provides a high a very high level view on how we're managing the the credit risk as a whole so if a pool of loans that is used as collateral for an advance if some percentage of those loans you know go bad, it the the federal home loan bank is protected by the haircut. They only lend seventy percent, and the collateral is is one hundred percent. So it would have to go below so, that floor in order for the federal home loan bank to experience a loss, which I'll remind our audience they never have. Yeah, the, the one caveat I would say is that if the loans are not performing, those loans would not be eligible to be pledged as collateral. And so they would have the member would have to provide us eligible collateral to 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 in essence top it off. So that's that's just a, a nuance to what you're what you're saying. So if if the loans were all in default, we wouldn't accept that as collateral. They would have to pledge us performing based loans, a pool of performing based mortgage loans for us to accept. And then we would provide a value on top of those mortgage loans. Mm -hmm. and, and what and happened? Off top of that. What happened to the level of haircut as interest rates rose in 2022, where whereby the market value of the pledged securities and and loans presumably declined in in value? Uh, I know there's something called a what a, a QCR. And what, how did that how did that change as interest rates rose, imposing a, a sort of mathematical, mechanical market based losses on on the securities in the same way credit, you know, credit issues closed, those securities would presumably be worth less. In this case, it was not credit. It was interest rates. Yeah. So Michael. depending upon depending upon the methodologies that 
individual banks use, we're going to provide a value to the collateral. Certainly, if there's more volatility in the marketplace, you're going to see a, a, a broader dispersion and certainly larger haircuts associated with the collateral itself. So as interest rates are increasing, the value of the collateral being pledged would, would decrease, especially if they're fixed rate type of loan collateral that's being pledged. So you have that, and then volatility would create larger haircuts on the collateral itself because there's a greater dispersion of potentially change in values of that collateral. So those two in, in, in sync would reduce the value overall. At the time that advances are made and, and collateral is assessed, or I should say at the time that collateral is assessed, because sometimes advances are made you know, after the fact, it, obviously it's kind of marked to market. And then you have this process that Michael just described. So there's never a surprise that, oh, that was you know a $1,000 face value, but really it was 932. Boy, we shouldn't have started from 1,000. We don't start from the 1,000. We start from the 932 because we assess it correctly at the time. And then I do want to point out this idea of having the haircut and other you know, strategies. What you would worry about, I think, in a risk scenario, one would be a temporary serious shock to the system that somehow you know, d- decreases the value of you know, holdings across the board or does all sorts of things, a la you know, um, great financial crisis. Now, one of the things to keep in mind for the federal home loan bank system is that we are very well capitalized and, and our dynamics of how we operate means that by and large, we aren't pressured to liquidate. So we, we, you've talked a lot about this banking accounting convenience slash problem, which is the you know, available for sale and hold to maturity difference, right? And, and that's a big focus of what's happened in the banking system last year. Well, when we, we don't have those designations in the same way, but when we decide to, let's imagine a scenario we actually had to take collateral. If, if we decide that that collateral is going through an intermediate phase of lower value, we have the option of truly holding to maturity. Like, like we, we have a lot of flexibility that say a small community bank would not have, a regional bank wouldn't have, and even sometimes really big banks. So again, when I think we talk about reforms to the system, the system welcomes, like I, you know, just cause it's worked really well for 90 years, which it has, doesn't mean there aren't a lot of lessons to be taken and then, you know, make update a system. Like if you're gonna be hundred years old, I hope you're a lot different from how you operated 30 years ago. But one of the things to keep in mind is that this nimbleness, and our ability to manage these risks in the system is actually a tremendous strength to the financial system as a whole. And one of the themes that I think has come out in terms of our response is we should be thoughtful and careful about how we implement these recommendations. And we need to bring them into the full light of day just so everyone can weigh in. Like, you know, Federal Home Loan Bank, we know a lot about what we do, but we aren't Moody's and we're not the analysts who follow the banks and we're not public policy folks who follow global debt markets, we need to give a chance for all those folks with the proposals in front of them, you know, whether it's a rule promulgation process or otherwise, to be able to observe and comment and give feedback because we're so systemically central to all the stuff that goes on. You don't want surprises and you don't want unintended consequences. And we have a good system in place to make sure you can avoid those as much as possible. Yeah. And a key principle, I think, correct me if I'm wrong, is that in many cases, maybe in all cases, the limiting factor of whether a you know when the when the federal home loan bank stops lending to a member institution is is one. I mean, if the the member doesn't want it, if it doesn't apply, but it is the amount of pledgeable assets. So you know, for commercial banks, many people think of the reserve requirements, where actually that doesn't really apply anymore. Banks are capital functionally; they are capital constrained. They you know they can't make loans when they run out of capital, although the way you, you know, they calculate that, that cal- capital is different. For, for the sake of taking advances from the Federal Home Loan Bank, it's not capital constrained because as both of you said, there's a self-capitalizing feature of a bank that has to take an advance out uh, simultaneously buy stock in the Federal Home Loan Bank. I, m- I might ask what happens if the Federal Home Loan Bank, if, if that member fails, I mean, who who has you know that equity? Um, that, that, that is one, one question. And then simul- simultaneously, in other words, you know, Silicon Valley Bank, uh, it stopped tapping the federal home loan bank of, of, of San Francisco because it ran out of eligible collateral to pledge, not because the federal home loan bank didn't have enough capital or not because the federal home loan bank, loan bank uh, you know, couldn't issue bonds in, in the marketplace. Like that is the, that is why a bank runs out of available liquidity is because they run out of eligible, eligible collateral to pledge. 
So it is correct that Silicon Valley Bank wasn't a function of the Federal Home Loan Bank not being able to help it, either because the Federal Home Loan Bank was capital constrained or otherwise. There are some logistics involved there because that was such a fast moving event. But I do think it is worth, and maybe Michael can expand on this, emphasizing again, not only for like functional safety and soundness reasons, is it important to think about the fact that the collateral is a limiting factor among many. It's credit worthiness first, and then collateral after that for members to be able to get advances. But it also ties us back to the nexus around housing, right? So this is a particular type of collateral. Maybe, Michael, you can expand on the type of collateral and how that intersects with, in part, the housing mission and what we do broadly. Yeah, so certainly the the level of collateral that members are, are eligible to pledge is dependent upon, you know, really through statute from from Congress. So Congress has established what types of collateral can be pledged to member institutions. And that's a, that's a governor in and of itself. The other thing I would just say that and with that in statute, the collateral is, is housing related. So think of that as residential home equity, residential mortgage-backed securities and other things of that nature. The other thing too, in relation to limitations on which we would lend to member institutions, all of the federal home loan banks have a, a level of which they would limit borrowings from from members as well. And so there is a, a cap that's that's established as well from a risk management perspective. So just because they have eligible collateral, if there's going to be uh, large concentrations, we would certainly look at that as well. So there, there are other governors in place uh, besides what you just mentioned, Jack. Mm -hmm. And Dan, talking about a federal home loan bank evaluates the credit, wor credit worthiness of a bank. Because the federal home loan banks have a you know, a super lean and they charge such a uh, a haircut and they have these these risk uh, analysis procedures and you know, they've never lost a dollar is it fair to say that if the federal home loan bank ha uh, uh, makes an advance to a a bank that subsequently fails there is no quote loss for the federal home loan bank so that you know why does JP Morgan not make a loan to people who are you know not or entities that are not credit worthy because if they do they'll make a loss is it fair to say that the federal home loan bank does not have that market incentive and i'm not saying that it influences them to you know be be reckless i'm just saying that it does not have that fundamental incentive of you know one bank makes a car loan to me and i don't pay it back they have a loss whereas if you know a federal home loan bank makes a loan in advance to that bank and that bank sub subsequently fails that federal home loan bank, you know, historically has not had a, a dollar in losses. Right. Yeah. So that's a, let me untangle that because I, I think that gets at the heart of some of the hard policy questions that are coming up. So first, as a matter of policy and absolutely a matter of practice, the federal home loan banks underwrite their members for credit worthiness and ability to repay. I mean, that's, that's, that's a standard practice. That's pure safety soundness. We shouldn't do otherwise. And then, of course, we assess collateral in addition to that as security against it. And when people say the super lean, what they mean, and, and you correctly used it, this idea that we have, you know, secured our loans and we have security interests in this collateral in such a way that, you know, it's really pretty much impregnable. But that's, that's, kind of a, a normal process. Any bank that can lend and can you know get security interest in the collateral will do so, we can do so in a very specific pattern way. So the question then I think is, do we have new insights into assessing credit worthiness and understanding our members in light of the great financial crisis in light of the last year or two? Absolutely. And I think that all of our credit models are evolving and the agency is very much working hand in hand. I would point out a couple of things though that are really important takeaways. We have always had, and I think there's room to e actually make it even more clear, either through yeah, some regs or otherwise, but we've always had very cooperative arrangements with the appropriate regulator for any given institution, whether it's the state regulator and the Fed or others, including the FDIC. And what I mean by that is where it gets interesting Let's say you underwrote a, a member, they were credit worthy, you assess their collateral, you have a certain amount of advanced capacity, but then the world starts to get you know, uncertain and shaky and they have advances outstanding. Some of those might need to roll over and or they might want to increase their advances. So what do you do then when their credit worthiness is now different from when you underwrote? That's a question that the federal home loan banks have been working with for a long time. They're very good at dealing with that. They're absolutely perfect at making sure they don't take a loss, right? That That's the collateral function. But I think the things that happen on the margin include working closely with the regulator. If the regulator says, hey, stop, 
don't do any more advances, the federal home loan banks stop, right? I mean, we have, we've stated that publicly, that's mm -hmm. a standard practice, but sometimes there's a bit of a nuance where the regulator might be like, if you can, please don't stop, right? Because we're, we're in the process of trying to make this bank work. And that's, you know, that we've written some stuff in the public sphere since the report came out, but that's the piece where I think people inappropriately label, you know, the banks is, or the federal loan banks is lender of last resort or lender of second last resort. That's actually not the question. The question is, in cooperation with the relevant agencies, the FDIC, the OCC, the Federal Reserve, should the banks, if they are certain about the collateral and have a, a good sense that they will absolutely get repaid, should the banks cooperate with those other federal entities in continuing advances during a period of stress, both to the system and perhaps the individual banks? So my personal opinion, taking off both of my hats, right? would be that I think the banks have to be very, the whole system has to be very careful about not removing that discretion and accidentally limiting it outright. Because when you decide to say that a bank or a financial institution no longer deserves advances from someone as credible as the federal home loan bank system, and that they just have to go to the Fed and that's all that le that's left, there's two issues. One, not everyone can go to the Fed. So you just doomed them. And two, even doing that, maybe you set in motion this process where people are like, oh my gosh, they're a failed bank. And banks aren't failed banks until they're a failed bank. And, and I think that gray area, we've done well, in my opinion, in the past, the federal home loan bank system navigating that. And we need to be given with new insight and more care and better cooperation, but we need to make sure we maintain the discretion for us to still do that in the future because we do play a part in making sure that good banks that are going through stressful times, you know, survive to fight another day. Just to add a couple of things from what, what Dan had, had mentioned, we do have very strong relationships with the federal regulators, our members' primary regulators. And one of the things that the, the FDIC is very focused on is minimizing the risk of loss to the insurance fund. And they leverage the federal home loan banks to ensure that, you know, we're providing funding liquidity, especially in times of stress, so that there is a, a minimum impact. And we've, we've worked directly with the FDIC in relation to that. And it's really to protect and minimize losses. And so there's there's that dynamic too that is is very important. And so leveraging the federal home loan banks to provide funding to as a bridge in times of stress is critical. And that's that's a key role that we play. Uh, yes, the federal home loan bank, you know, it, it always has uh, advances at, um, outstanding. So it is a lender through every cycle, every part of the business cycle. Um, but as you say, it is ex expected that these peak during periods of banking stress. Uh, however, it is not the lender of last resort, that, and that is the Federal Reserve. So one charge that the FHFA's report makes is that there were some advances, and I, I don't think they, they state this as clearly, as, as boldly as I'm going to state them. You know, I'm, I'm sort of paraphrasing. They, they're much more you know, po political about it, but that there were some loans that were made advances that were made by federal home loan banks in 2022, perhaps in 2020, early 2023, that the Federal Reserve should have made. It was, you know, it, it typically was the reserve, uh, the remit of the Federal Reserve to make dis loans to institutions via the discount window or via the bank term funding program, a program that was, you know, incidentally set up two days after Silicon Valley Bank failed. So, so that, that was one of the, the many charges that, that this analysis from the FHA makes. All categorize broadly a few others. Uh, one is that the federal home loan bank's mission uh, to, to fund um, housing and uh, community development and affordable housing uh, specifically should be uh, emboldened and, and defined. One is that their operational costs should you know, you know, wax and wane, I guess, with, with advances. So when you have a decline in uh, the amount of advances, as you did maybe from 2009, 2010 to you know, 2000, you know, a few, few years later at coming out of the great financial crisis, or as you did from 2020 into 2021, when you know, money was free, interest rates were zero, the Federal Reserve was doing a ton of quantitative easing, you know, money, was, money was abundant, and the federal home loan bank system advances uh, worked down, uh, um, um, you know, were, were declined. The, again, this analysis doesn't say it, but it kind of implies, well, maybe the operational expenses of federal home loan banks should go down as well if the amount of, of, of support it is, is uh, go going down. 
And then it, it, I think it really only mentions this in, in passing, but it talks about executive compensation, which is, goes along with, with operational structure. So I guess I, I just laid out some broad points that the Federal Housing Financial Authority underscores as, as room, for, room for regulation. And again, I should say this is a report or an, an analysis that was always going to happen. It's the Federal Home Loan Bank system at 100, 100 you know, it's founded 100 years ago, uh, focusing on the future. I think this review started before the failure of Silicon Valley Bank. So it's not, this is not a, oh, because these banks failed, we need to make changes. These are, we were pro proposing changes anyway. And this, you know, gives us a little bit of a, a wind at, at our sails to propose some, some regulations. And, you know, needless to say, these are very slow moving things and they, you know, need to go through various boards and, and be approved. But, but starting with, with you, Dan, on, on that topic of, Federal home loan bank making advances that the, is the, the the remit of the Federal Reserve to make. I mean, do you accept that uh, statement, or, or would you like to challenge or qualify it in some regard? Yeah, I, I think it's a it's the right place to pay attention, right? So I don't fault looking at that and trying to ask that question. On the other hand, I would suggest that it's an oversimplified view to simply say, you know, some of this stuff should have gone to the Federal Reserve. So first of all, I think what it's saying is these institutions should have knocked on the door of the Federal Reserve. It's no guarantee that they really would have been able to get the advances. And I'll, I'll explain why in just a second. But I think it's the right place to look. I don't think I would characterize the advances that occurred as inappropriately from Federal Home Loan Bank and not the Federal Reserve. So let's take a backward example. So the bank term funding program, right, was created after Silicon Valley Bank failed. And one would say, gosh, why don't they, they should have had First Republic really just go to Fed. They're big, they they had the ability to go to the Federal Reserve. Why don't they do that? They could have used this program. Well, uh, as it turns out, this ties to the housing issue. The, as you may recall, the First Republic had lots of loans held directly, mm -hmm. right? The, and the bank term funding program only allowed MBS. So it had to be securities. And so ironically, you know, the housing function provided by First Republic made it harder for them to take those assets and bring them to the bank term funding program. In fact, those assets would have been as collateral disallowed. So, so there's, you know, that it isn't always the case that that can happen. And as importantly, and I don't think this report helped with this, I worry about the persistent stigma of going to the Fed window, right? And now the bank term funding program was designed so to reduce that stigma, but I still worry about that problem writ large. So what the Federal home loan banks should do and have been doing, but I think have accelerated, is work with members to be prepared to help them go to the Fed, right? There's there's some connections you have to create. There's collateral structure you have to set up. There's stuff you have to do that you probably can't do in a big hurry in an emergency. And I can speak for the San Francisco bank, you know, wh whether they're stressed or not, we've been urging and working with our member banks and, and other institutions to be ready to go to the Fed window. So I, I think that's an example. Again, it's it's all these things are complicated, it's nuanced, but I would say that the pattern of advances actually worked out pretty well when you if backward looking and you say, how did that, how did that turn out? And the number one thing I would say if you want to judge those advances is go to the appropriate regulatory agency, whether it's FDIC or the Fed or otherwise, and ask them to assess the pattern. Did they like it? Did they not like it? Did it make things better? Did it make things worse? And I think in those conversations, including in some public testimony from the FDIC, you will hear that you know the federal home loan bank system was a very welcome partner in that process during that time. And I think that that's probably the ultimate litmus test I would use. Yeah, so I, I completely grant your point that there's a stigma associated with borrowing from the Federal Reserve's discount window or any other program at the Federal Reserve. I might also say there's, there's a stigma of, of taking advances from the federal home loan bank system during periods of stress. Like I, I you know, very was, was actively following First Republic's filings of, oh, how much is it borrowing from the federal home loan bank? $28 billion. That that seems like a lot. And then it's it's also borrowing, you know, taking deposits from JP Morgan, which, which subsequently acquired their assets. And, you know, now that we have this hard data that was released in the report, you know, obviously both of, both of you had this data for a while, but the $28.1 billion was how much First Republic borrowed or had out, out, outstanding in middle of March of this year. And that you know, shot up from 18 or 19 billion, you know, at the beginning of March, because that's when the you know, Silicon Valley Bank collapsed, and then it did not increase at all. So that makes me think that they were kind of tapped out. Like in other words, if they could borrow more, 
but they wanted to. So Dan, were, was I, I presume they wanted to borrow more money because they, they needed money. I mean, was it the role of, of the um, Federal Home Loan Bank of San Francisco to, to you know, inform First Republic, sorry, you know, you're, you've run out of eligible collateral. We, we can't do any more because presumably they, they would want to get more than 28.1. Yeah, I actually, I don't have details on those specifics, nor even if I did, am I allowed to share them. But what I can say, though, and, and let's tease this out, I agree that peak crisis during that phase, any emergency or hurried borrowing in large amounts is always stigmatizing, whether it's from the Fed, whether it's from the federal home loan bank system, or whether it's from a conglomerate led by JP Morgan, right? Like, mm-hmm. all, all of that is going to be stigmatizing. The stigma differentiation for the Federal Reserve versus others, including the Federal Home Loan Bank, is what I would call early stress phase, right? It's when you aren't paying particular attention, Jack, and I know you pay attention to who's doing what in what case. If suddenly it pops up on the radar that a mid-sized regional bank that you had not particularly ever noticed before has filed that they have pulled money from the Fed discount window, that that's stigmatizing. So you're right. Once it's peak crisis, it, it's stigma all over the place. That's almost like no stigma because it's everything's kind of bad. I, the other thing I would point out, though, is it's very hard after the fact until much later, and, and we won't know bank term funding, to tease out exactly what happened with any given institution because the bank term funding program, you know, large institutions clearly do have some, you know, no matter what they do, do have securities that are eligible there. So you can't tell what was happening you know, until much later when the Fed discloses everything. So I, I would say we should study that. And my takeaway, my number one takeaway for this is that I think that the closer cooperation between the federal home loan banks and the relative relevant regulators and attention to some new nuances about what makes, you know, a bank more or less credit worthy under certain circumstances all those things should be incorporated to behavior moving forward for the federal home loan bank system. And I would say most of it's already there. I think we're talking about formalizing it and saying, if you don't do this consistently, you're below a required or best practice. And and I think most of the banks, and I can only speak for the San Francisco bank, clearly already do this. But I do like it when we know it's a good thing to do to make it be formal, make it be required, hold people to account, make it examinable. So that kind of behavior, I think, is certainly fair game. And and there should be transparency and cooperation where it's possible. And, and if yeah. I may fo- follow up on that, so does that current process or would the proposed process include taking into consideration declines in market value of home loans or mortgage-backed securities or securities and how that might impact tier one capital. I believe Michael said earlier, you know, if you had a mortgage-backed security that was at $100 uh, and now it's worth $85, we're not going to be, you know, lending to them, pretending that it's worth $100, even though they can show me some papers saying that it was at one time worth $100. We're going to, you know, we're actively in the market and we're going to make a haircut against that, against the true market value. That's on the advanced side about making loans. But in terms of the team banks, how they report their own capital, they are allowed to use that, you know, kind of pretend number. So, you know, is it fair to say that w- one part with, with, with one hand on the, the federal home loan banks lending side, they are taking into account the reality of mark to market losses. But on the other side, they are taking at face value, the reported capital values that may actually be a negative number if they uh, were mark to market value. So I know, uh, you know, there were some banks, and I believe Silicon Valley Bank was um, among them, whose Tan, uh, whose reported equity was less than the declines in, in market value of securities, some of which I should say the vast majority of which were in held to maturity accounts. But, you know, uh, and I know, you know, no bank, if it had to be liquidated in, w- in one day is truly, truly solvent. But yeah, what, what are you, where are you thoughts, Dan? Let me, let me give an early comment and have Michael expand on that, because that's a pretty sophisticated, you know, credit risk monitoring function, which we do actively. The, the one big picture here, though, is that as a member's credit worthiness and overall situation deteriorates, obviously the federal home loan banks are in the mix on that because they're interacting with the relevant agencies, getting updates, we have our own systems, but there are already a lot of steps that take place. For example, you may shorten the um, overall term or the tenor of you know, current advances. You will obviously remark to market the eligible collateral. So the collateral function and marking that to market appropriately is kind of built in. What you've asked, is an interesting bigger picture question about creditworthiness and the accounting, you know, 
optics of a given member relative to how we assess their credit worthiness. And each bank's a little different, but I think we're really eyes wide open on that process. But I, I, Michael would know better than I do in terms of how that really works as that happens. Yeah. So, so the federal home loan banks were evaluating the credit worthiness of all of our members. So we take into account a number of, of things that, that we certainly take into account the capital position of the member itself. To the extent that they have negative tangible capital, we're precluded from being able to lend to them unless we receive a, a non-objection from their primary regulator. So that's, that's already a, a governor in place that we, that we employ. And I, and I think- the oh, Sorry, Michael, but that, isn't it that, true for, for that tangible capital for at least some banks? You know, it, it, they're not including things like goodwill or you know the value of the brand, but they don't include lo- losses on securities if they're held in a held to maturity uh, account, right? Yes, um, but we're still monitoring the health and and the quality of the member institution itself, and so it's they're deteriorating in in quality, credit quality. We we take additional measures to ensure that we're protecting the the risk of the, of the institution of the federal home loan bank in that regard. So we'll take other steps to manage our, our risk exposure. It, and it also, if they're in a deteriorated state, we'll also be engaging with their primary regulator as well, as we would lend to the institution if they came in to, in to borrow from the bank. I guess the, the one thing is just to take a, a step back. I think that in the report that the finance agency had issued in the system at 100, uh, they did certainly focus on the need for the federal home loan banks to uh, evaluate the creditworthiness of the of the member institutions and ensure that we are uh, building more robust practices in place. And I think that that's something that we need to continue to look at our existing standards that we have, and to the extent that we need to provide more timely information and, and review. Certainly, that's that's something that we are evaluating as as well. I do think that there is, you know, part of the recommendation is, as well as understanding when members are in stress and how member members access the federal home loan bank and, and how the federal home loan bank is utilized versus the, the the Fed. And I think that we need to have conversations with the primary regulators on what that would potentially look like. I think more importantly, though, in the so there are lessons learned, but more importantly, as we look at the report itself, we want to ensure that, you know, this is done through a rulemaking process and that our members understand what is being asked of them instead of going through a a supervisory process where it may be more opaque. So having that transparency is is really important for us so that our members understand what role we play as well as what role the Fed plays as well. Thank you, Dan. I was going to say, Jack, if I can translate that a little bit. So, so um, I, I think that's exactly right. Uh, one thought, which maybe we take for granted, but not everyone knows. So most of the time, the federal home loan banks have non-public information about their members. Now, it's a little complicated, but we get cooperative information from regulators in many cases. We certainly get disclosures related to you know, our advance process. And so just, just so that you have a sense, we aren't just operating off of public metrics. I, I raise that because if there's an optics issue, I would say it's safe to say we would not be fooled by a simple accounting optics trick. It would be more subtle than that because we have underlying information. But to the big picture point about the process. So let us imagine that there is a credit worthiness process. And I, I think I mentioned this once before, but the banks are in at, at the same time, all financial institutions are, are moving from sophisticated scorecard systems by and large, and I can speak for San Francisco, and over time, this is a big picture trend everywhere, moving towards more sophisticated, what you might call scientific models. And they might run those side by side, they might do a lot of things. So this difference between you know, promulgating a new rule if you want to change the process by which the banks evaluate creditworthiness and hold them to account to that versus doing it by exam. What that means, if you don't live in the banking system, and again, I come at this as like a recovering finance professor and, and a person very familiar with the banking system, but bankers, when they say, you know, regulation by exam, what, what they mean is that when they go through their regular exam process, 
items are identified, either big deal items or recommendations or something in between. And I think it is certainly the council's position, and I think most of the federal home banks believe this very strongly, that if there are going to be material changes, so maybe you say, listen, on this credit item, that's a big black mark. It wasn't before, but let's make that thing a black mark. If that's going to become formalized, what you want to see happen is that to come out as a rule for it to be published in the Federal Register, for it to give a chance to have people comment on it and for it then to be adopted or modified or whatever, you don't want it to show up where the regulator examines a bank and says, I know we haven't done this before, but there's this new way of thinking we have. And we're gonna mark that you have a deficiency here because you haven't really adapted to our new way of thinking. Now, I don't think you have to be a bad actor to go about that. In fact, that can sometimes be faster, but I think the problem with that is that it skips the public scrutiny, it increases the risk of surprises, it has unintended consequences, and I think we want to avoid that. And importantly, all those interactions are by law confidential and secret. The Federal Home Loan Bank may not disclose to the public that a regulator showed up and said, you used to use this formula, we want you to use this formula, and please do so. You can't announce to the world that you're doing this other thing. And that's, that's a Bank secrecy stuff exists for lots of good reasons, but this is kind of a weird way it shows up, which is not good for public policy. So uh, that's a funny theme, but every question you ask about the recommendations in the report, I'll have opinions about this. Mm -hmm. but the number one thing I'll say is I'll sleep better if the ones that are material at all, which is most of them, go through a public visible, transparent scrutiny process where people come onto shows like yours and they talk about it. There's the blogospheres, you know, active about it. People are writing comment letters. That process, though cumbersome, sometimes has meant that the United States, we have a huge executive bureaucracy, that's for sure. And I think more often than not, American taxpayers are not super happy with that bureaucracy. But anyone who has ever traveled or lived abroad will be able to compare and contrast that by and large, we have a superior executive bureaucracy relative to other places in part because of this process, where if you propose something crazy, you're going to get a thousand or 10,000 or 20,000 letter comments about it. And the agency is going to be like, oh, oops, sorry, didn't realize that. We'll modify it. And that's a good process. Sorry, that constituted a diatribe. But I feel super strongly about it. Like It's a yeah. big deal. It's a big deal. It wasn't a diatribe. And I, I should say some of the, you know, the the recommendations that were in this report are, you know, by their very nature of being in this report public, although they're, you know, they lack a, um, um, some, some specifics. So I, I should say, Dan... So the, the entire banking world and the banking regulation world allows an accounting methodology of if you put a security into a held maturity uh, portfolio, you don't have to report. Well, you can report the losses, but that, that you know that doesn't count against um, capital. And when it comes to a, available for sale, I forget the exact thing. It may depend on on size. So I I apologize I'm forgetting the details. So your position, Dan, and your position, Michael, is this ac accounting treatment when it comes to uh, deciding credit worthiness, I mean, does that factor in at all? Because at the end of the report, in the, the appendix uh, of, of the FHFA's report, they have this bubble chart. And on the y-axis, it shows unrealized losses relative to tier one capital. And this huge green dot, Silicon Valley Bank, showed that uh, there was a time where those losses exceeded negative 100% or were more negative um, the net negative uh, 100%. And First Republic, that large orange dot, uh, was somewhere in the 30 to 40%. Although if you include the losses on mortgages, uh, the interest rate losses on mortgages, which sounds like the federal home loan, a federal home loan bank would and does take into account when applying a haircut or deciding how much to lend against the collateral, uh, I don't believe those are included because you know the, the people typically do, do not. They typically are reported at, at face value. Needless to say, and this is a you know a, a, a ray of, of shiny sunshine. One one positive that is not mentioned is the value of the deposits. They are not marked to market. So you know the fact that people are willing to hold their deposits you know for ten years or twenty years as a non interest bearing deposit because they're a business, and that money can earn five point five percent in in a Federal Reserve account or you know, interest rate. That is not valued as well. So maybe if those were valued, these these numbers would look a little bit more ominous. So I'm not saying that if you and the federal home loan bank systems are making any valuations or judgments that the rest of the financial and banking world 
are, are not. Are, are you so? It, it, but Dan, you're saying that okay, look, the, they said their tier one capital is is good, you know, even though their unrealized losses are greater than as a, as a percentage. And this can talk about Silicon Valley Bank specifically, or I mean, there there are definitely other banks um, to whom this applies. Is is the I mean, how 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 integral is that to your analysis of credit worthiness? And might it be a time for a change to focus a little bit more on that in, in the future? So I, I do think there's a, a good argument for an increased focus on credit worthiness. I mean, no doubt about it. That's a, that's writ large inside the report. That's been a, a lot of the conversation between the federal home loan banks and the agency throughout the year. And I don't think anyone in the right mind doesn't think we should be paying even more attention in a nuanced way, in an active way, and even more updated way to credit worthiness. So that's that's the easy part of the answer. I'm going to have Michael expand on your technical question, but I want to go back to this example of why you still have to be careful about not public rulemaking on something like this. So let's imagine that there's a shock to the system and you have 150 basis point increase in the effective you know, cost of capital. So you know, it goes from five something percent to six and a half percent. You know, the risk-free rate shoots up for a little while. All of a sudden, you could argue that a half to two thirds of the entire banking system has this net negative tangible equity problem, right? So the question is, do you want to create a rule that strips discretion away from the federal home loan bank system during a time of stress? And that's a legitimate question. I'm not actually presuming the answer, but what I am saying is the debate around what that answer should be should happen in the public because you're going to have a bunch of people who we don't necessarily interact with, but are going to come up in, with scenarios and questions that make you say, oh, that's an interesting point. And you may land on a different part of that policy position. Because by the way, for my part, I don't think you want want rules that are unwaivable. We currently have a non-objection rule for this negative tangible equity, but you don't want non-waivable rules that haven't been well debated that kick in at the moment when you might need the most discretion. It's a hard question, no doubt about it, but I, I just don't want this made under the Bank Secrecy Act between a bank, meaning the Federal Home Loan Bank, and the agency. That's not the right place to hash out exactly how to do this. I think it needs to be in the public sphere. Now, is it in a, you know, comply with the Administrative Procedures Act sort of regulatory, you publish it in the you know Federal Register sort of thing? Probably. Does some of the stuff need congressional action? Yeah, I think some of it does, right, depending on how you think about it. And that's good. I, I, I It means we don't move as fast as we would like, but that's good. Now, to your specific question about like what our position would be and how that would work, Michael's the one best equipped to answer that. I'm I'm not the I'm not the data guy. Yeah, and, and I, you know what I would say is just in relation to the report itself, recognize that we need to expand and enhance the credit practices that we have, and certainly we'll address those those issues as they've come up in examinations and other things as well. So, you know that's that's part of normal course of business, normal course of operations. Are we focused on and concerned about credit of our member institutions? Absolutely. So if we need to expand and enhance the practices that we have, we'll, we'll certainly do that. You know, the other, the other piece too is in, in the report, looking at how the federal home loan banks transition uh, from lending to member institutions versus the Fed. I think that's something that, you know, many of us do have intercreditor agreements in place with with the federal reserves in our district as and with the member institutions that we know how that would that would be handled and you know part of this also is making sure that our members recognize that they have other liquidity sources as well so if they can utilize the federal home loan bank or utilize the fed they have those options available and i think that was a, a big learning moment coming through the the crisis back in march and so we want to make sure that we have the right uh, practices and and policies and in, in place. However, you know, as as Dan pointed out, to the extent that the the finance agency wants to do this through a supervisory process, I think it's better as we look through through all the mechanics and the potential unintended consequences. It would be better if it was done through rulemaking, so people can weigh in and understand what are the economic implications of some of these changes and what this really means. I think that would be a better, more transparent way so folks understand the implications. And on member banks being able to tap the Federal Reserve via the discount window, there was a sentence in the report that confused me. The Federal Home Loan Banks can better serve their members if they coordinate with large depository institution members and the members' prudential regulators 
and this is the part that matters, to make certain that these members have established protocols to meet their emergency liquidity needs from the Federal Reserve discount window when necessary. Dan, earlier you mentioned that some of the federal home loan bankers don't have access to the Federal Reserve. I would suspect that those members are small, you know, non-bank institutions, maybe those CVFIs, community development financial institutions. I, I would, I'm, I'm pretty sure Silicon Valley Bank, First Republic, they could tap the, the discount window. So what is, what is that in reference to? It's two parts, and maybe Michael might expand on it. So one, to your point, it is correct. So the vast majority of large institutions obviously have access to the Federal Reserve. Um, there are a wide variety of different institutions, including you know banks, you know certain credit unions, et cetera, that don't don't have direct access or access at all to the Federal Reserve. But what I think the report might have been referring to is something that actually Michael was just discussing and is eminently solvable. So that's good news. And I think most of the federal loan banks are underway. And that is. There's actually what, in layman's terms, there's paperwork and piping that needs to be set up ahead of time in order to appropriately access whether it's the discount window or or any special programs. And it has to do with you know identifying and marking your collateral, you know, setting up you know agreements. And it can't happen as quickly as you would probably like if you're in a big hurry. And so I I think that might have been the reference because you know the federal home loan bank is in a really good position because of how we interact with our members to say hey. By the way, have you gone through the slightly time-consuming logistical process of laying the groundwork so that if you ever did have to access the Fed window, you could do so quickly? And if the answer is no, I can't speak for the other banks, but what we do is we say, well, let's let's help you with that a little bit. Let's let's figure out how to do that. And you'd be surprised there are some very large institutions who, you know, just haven't gotten around to it. And so I think that's being fixed system-wide. Michael, I don't I don't know if that's your experience as well. Well, yeah, I, and I think that's just prudent risk management practices that our member institutions need to ensure that they have right, you know, liquidity procedures, practices in place and, and ensuring that they can tap into the Fed in times of crisis, that that's also a good practice to have. One of the things, one of the lessons learned through the, the most recent uh, bank crisis in March was the speed at which deposits left the banking system was unprecedented. And number two was the size. And so, you know, if if we think about it into the future, what it could look like, it really makes it even more important that members have that liquidity access, not only to the federal home loan banks in times of crisis, but also if there's other needs that they can actually tap into the to the Fed. And, you know, what we learned was that in the crisis, not every member could easily tap into the Fed. And and as Dan mentioned, you know, this requires legal agreements to be set in place and not only with the member institution, but also with the Fed and the federal home loan banks. And so that those take time to work out. And if you're at the end of the day, it's not it's not going to get rubber stamped. And so that's we need to build this into how we think about providing lending in times of crisis as we move forward. And, and we'll continue to look at how, how we do that and evaluate it. Just to be clear, I, I, don't, I think it's such a different world than it was 10 years and certainly 20 years ago that not having the mechanics in place, I think 20 years ago was a, maybe a non-issue because just to be comparatively clear about the difference, like when the WAMU failure was underway, let's imagine if you want to analogize, that's a person jogging and walking briskly in terms of the run, the Silicon Valley Bank was like a motorcycle that just went whoosh, right? So so the speed with which that happened, thinking to yourself, two, three, four business days, we can get stuff in place if it ever happens. We can uh, do that. That, and, and that's we now know the lesson is 48 hours may be too much time to get your you know, house in order for purposes of accessing the Fed. And if that's true, then everyone should do it in advance. I would suggest that's a relatively new lessons in, lesson in like prudent risk management. Now, we're the best players always doing it. Sure, you can detect that a little bit, by the way, in public filings by publicly traded banks and other institutions where they'll talk about their risk mitigation. They might comment on their alternative emergency sources of funding. The Federal Reserve is one part of that. And you can pick up if they're doing more or less on that. Because I, as Michael said, I don't even know. But I, I, if, if I was looking for it, that's where I would go to look. By the way, I, I, we didn't comment on your other questions about like operating expenses and size and exact comp. Did you want to still go to that or what? Y- yes, I do. But I just want to say thank you, Dan, for clarifying. So it's that some of these banks or institutions, they had access on paper 
to the Federal Reserve. They just didn't set up the channels. It's, it's something they, they needed a few days to set up and they didn't, they couldn't afford a few days. They needed it now. Got it. Thanks for clarifying it. All right. So, so now let's talk about, there's a, a general uh, assertion or a, a feeling, insinuation uh, in some parts of the FHA FA report that Federal Home Loan Banks needs to return to its mission of funding housing and affordable housing. And before we, you know, we talk about uh, the specific recommendations, you know, Dan, I'll, I'll cite a few examples. You know, one, for example, is Silicon Valley Bank, a, a bank for you know, venture capitalists who are typically you know, pretty well healed. They made they made a lot of mortgage loans. They bought a lot of mortgage backed securities, but they they were not you know doing a lot of, of lending in the affordable housing market. I, I have the stats. I think 1.3 billion of, of investments in qualified housing projects. To, to a balance sheet of you know well over you know cl- close to 200 billion so so like less than 1% of all assets but still 1.3 billion is large but just as a percentage it is not that meaningful you know first republic bank uh, also um, you know made a lot of well the first republic bank did make a, a, a lot of uh, mortgage loans to be fair uh, you know anecdotally they did make a, a loan to mark zuckerberg at you know, i think 1.05% of course that is anecdotal but you know if if your client base is generally you know pretty wealthy folks. I mean, is that part of the mission? Do you know if 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 all of the you know if there's a bank who made 100% loans, but they were all to you know you know millionaires at very low interest rates, would is that you know filling the federal home loan bank's mission? Or you know for a, that affordable housing mission, does there also need to be uh, some component of that? And then I think I think the, the biggest example and the, the 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 most pointed language in this report was. They use the word tenuous in relation to Silvergate banks receiving uh, advances from the Federal Home Loan Bank. And Silvergate initially started as a mortgage finance company, but over the past few years, they had in, uh, you know invent- reinvented themselves as a crypto bank, and they you know banked many institutions, including I think the the fallen FTX. And I don't know they didn't have FTX, but they they tr- uh, facilitated transfers on that network. I, I'm I'm pretty confident to say. And so, but they, they borrowed heavily from the Federal Home Loan Bank. So like, let's take the most extreme example, you know, uh, Dan, you're a, you're a lawyer. And when you, you try and make a case, you, you take the, you know, the most extreme, extreme example. I mean, is, is that appropriate? Is that part of the mission if you have a bank whose primary business is banking crypto clients? And then with all those deposits, they buy some mortgage-backed securities on the side, which I believe don't really have any credit, credit risk. Is, you know, is that fulfilling the mission? And if, if you argue yes, why? So a couple of things. Silvergate is a complicated example in part because they evolved over time. And I think one of the red flags that we look at now and you look backwards is like, gosh, if the bank grows really, really fast, its fundamental nature changes, should we assess it differently? But that's the conversation we just had about kind of credit worthiness and, and being smarter about that. The other question about should you be providing advances? So if you're a member of the Federal Home Loan Bank, not easy to do, you have to qualify. If you're a member of good standing and you have the appropriate collateral, which to your point, it, it could be mortgage-backed securities, it could be you know uh, loans held that are mortgage-related or other, or, or multifamily housing loans. It, may, it could be any number of things, but you can't get advances unless you have that collateral. Now, I think the point you might be making as a as an argument that some make is like, well, you know, this mortgage-backed security thing, you know, that's no good. We want them to get their hands dirty. We want them to go out. We want them to lend money directly. I will tell you that you should certainly hold the federal home loan banks at the federal home loan bank level to account about performing on the affordable housing mission, which is the co-mission with liquidity. Liquidity was actually first when we were created in 1932, but housing has always been a part of it and became more formally a part of it, you know, 20, 30 years ago. But I don't think at each individual member level, it makes sense to do other than what we already have in place, which is you can't get advances unless you have qualifying collateral. Congress set what was qualifying collateral. And personally, I think it's very disingenuous and maybe even naive to say, well, mortgage-backed securities, that doesn't count. Really? Do you want to disincentivize holdings of MBS? Do you want to decrease aggregate demand for MBS just like that? If we think the current mortgage rates are bad, imagine if we disincentivize 40% of MBS holdings. What a disaster. So I, I, I don't think it's fair to say you have to get your hands dirty. Now, if a federal home loan bank has only banks that look like you know Silvergate or others where over time they were less at the intersection of housing and they don't perform on their affordable housing, well, then hold them to account. 
But I think I mentioned this the other day. I, I think a portfolio of members makes sense. Some will do a lot. I would say Silicon Valley Bank, by the way. So yeah, I guess as a percentage of balance sheet, it wasn't a whole bunch. But by the way, that's a little lagging, right? Because their balance sheet grew so quickly. But also, I don't think we want to, you know, scoff at $1.3 billion worth of affordable housing intersection, not to mention all the MBS and other things that they held. But on top of that, they also sponsored a lot of programs and projects. In fact, we know that because we cooperate with them and we had to find homes for each of those projects. And the Federal Home Loan Bank of San Francisco found a home, I think it was 19 active projects worth a whole bunch where they were playing some role which may not show up on the report that you're looking at. So again, hold the banks at the Federal Home Loan Bank level to account don't make such a very specific rule at each member level. And that includes, by the way, one of the proposals, the blunt proposal is this kind of 10% nexus, which most of our members meet in spades. But for some, like insurance companies, I would rather have the public policy debate about that, but you would be excluding a lot of insurance companies because their balance sheets are so huge, of course, right? So you could be talking about a substantial component you know, in real terms, but as a percentage of assets, it may not qualify. The, the irony is that you know, insurance companies, CDFIs, they're, they play critical roles in housing. And that if you keep at a, at a 10% test, then you're excluding CDFIs, which are very important in community development, where they wouldn't have the mortgage related assets to then even qualify. And I don't think that's, I think that when we talk about unintended consequences, that's an unintended consequence impact that would be negative impact. So I, I think we need to be careful in how this gets set up. As it relates to mortgage related assets, there is, it's, it's set out in, in the statute and the rule itself. And it, it includes one to four family mortgage loans. It includes residential mortgage backed securities and a number of other housing related types as well. So it's, it's a very extensive list of, of assets that would qualify as mortgage mortgage assets. When the Federal Reserve buys and holds mortgage-backed securities, probably pretty similar sec- securities to what Silicon Valley Bank held, or you know, I mean, they're somewhat somewhat fungible. That you know, th- they don't say they 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 specifically, I think, de- deny that they are stimulating the housing markets. In other words, it's to stimulate the economy. In other words, the Federal Reserve does not have an affordable housing mission. When they when they buy mortgage-backed securities, they they are trying to meet their uh, macroeconomic goals uh, that are you know given to them via Congress, but it's not the same goal as uh, to to uh, support that the housing market specifically. Even though on the fact on the ground, I actually sort of agree with the Federal Home Loan Bank and not with Federal Reserve that that is what what really happens. You know, you can see a correlation between periods of quantitative easing and like mortgage-backed securities spreads. Dan, I would say Silicon Valley Bank, one point three billion dollars, undoubtedly a lot. But if you compare you know compare that to their their venture capital business about you know lending to basically institutional investors or, or management management firms when they you know have to call up their, their clients to, to to actually sort of you know, use the dry powder that's on the sidelines. I would say that's a, a tiny fraction, and I, I just looked it up that their you know their their wine business like I think they lent nine hundred you know million dollars of, of wine loans. So it's like their affordable housing is only marginally only somewhat larger than their you know lending to wineries. So I would I would would you agree with the statement that Silicon Valley Bank was a large uh, affordable housing lender, but that's only because it was so large. Like, as a percentage of its assets, it was by no means large. Yeah, yeah. I, I think, it, and to just clarify that, right? So it was, their, their, their affordable housing portfolio was larger than most community banks. We'll stop. The whole bank. Right. So you're right, though. I mean, could they do more? Should we look back? There's a whole set of policies, laws and regs that control that function. Right. The CRA, Community Reinvestment Act. And and I, I don't know enough to comment on that other than, again, to say, you know, I would take a smaller piece of a big bank doing a lot over you know, a rule that, you know, doesn't allow them to be a part of the federal home loan bank system in part because of this simple scale equation. So, you know, Silicon Valley Bank used advances. They had a lot of MBS. They did stuff that in turn, even though we, we are, we are hedging all this risk and we de-risk this whole transaction, there is still a little itty bitty bit of margin left. And we're talking about big numbers, right? So the federal home loan bank system therefore makes profits. And those profits, a portion of them go from our pocket directly, not from the bank, our pocket into affordable housing. And so again, insofar as 
it's a member in good standing. They're, you know, they do have a nexus that could have been bigger, I guess, but they have a substantial real nexus with housing and they generate profits in the federal home loan bank system that in turn are put into affordable housing. I'm actually okay with that. I, in fact, that seems like a pretty virtuous cycle to me because in turn, we can then take some of that affordable housing and leverage other members who maybe are more on the ground. Maybe they're a CDFI or they are a small community bank and they're doing really interesting stuff and it's a third or a half or two thirds of their balance sheet that they're working on doing interesting things. That gives us the capital to kind of, you know, push their way. So it's an ecosystem. You can't have 100% of members be like Silicon Valley Bank. That probably wouldn't work. But you also can't have everybody be like a small community bank, because ironically, we wouldn't support community banks as well if that was the case. It is a diversified portfolio of members. And I think that's that's good. In fact, I, I don't know if we arrived at it by luck or design, kind of doesn't matter. It's actually, I think, one of the pieces of the secret sauce for the stability and longevity and success of the federal home loan bank system. All right, um, gentlemen, we, we've run long, but uh, I got the final point about operational uh, expenses. In the, the the report, there is a chart uh, which you know, has two different y axes. So you know you got to be careful about charts like that. But they they do uh, presume to show the growth of federal home loan bank assets, so you know MBS uh, advances and the and the like, relative to the expenses of of the federal home loan banks. And I think it, it is in aggregate. And the chart shows and the you know, accompanying language declares that throughout 2021, again, total easy money, banks didn't really need money that, you know, JP Morgan was telling depositors to go away, basically, that uh, the, the advances at the Federal Home Loan Bank declined. However, operational expenses, m- maybe they declined a little bit, then they went, they went up, went up, you know, these, these you know, lines tend to, to wiggle a- around, but it, it, they did not have a corresponding drop. The insinuation being that Federal home loan banks, you know, maybe should you know, basically lower lower their expenses so that more can go back into the communities. What is your, your response? And that I think they do mention executive compensation, you know, as well, which is you know per the SEC filings disclosed. So so Dan, what is what is your re- response to that? And then Michael. Sure. So two two thoughts. First, I think if you look at the federal home loan bank system, almost all of that expenditure is people, right? I mean, it's mainly it's mainly people. There's some systems, but it's mainly salaries and people. And the federal home loan banks are actually pretty nimble. For example, we're talking hundreds of employees, not thousands of employees. And recognize that there's a lot of incentive to do this right, because while a large portion of the profits go to affordable housing, a larger portion of the profits, and that's a separate debate, but a larger portion of the profits go back to the members. The members care a lot about how much capital you're building up, because that means the co-op works better and is safer and there when they need it, and how much of the remaining capital you might hand back to them in the form of dividends. So there's like attentive pressure to keep costs down. So with that in mind, I think one of the hardest things is that there's an accordion in nature. So in 2020, you know, advances plummeted as the Fed flooded the system with liquidity, right? And so if you were going to say, well, let's only be what we need to be for that specific moment in time, you might have shrunk the system. But that's very hard to do because lo and behold, a year later, we're ramping up and two years later, we're really ramping up. So I think you have to be thoughtful about minimum infrastructure. I like the idea of Centers for Excellence. Our board, our current chair, my predecessor, happens to be on the board of the Federal Reserve as well. And the Federal Reserve does a good job of having Centers of Excellence. And I think that is a future for the federal home loan bank system to you know, you know, know, systematize and maybe save some money and certainly to uh, you know level out the growth. But I would, I would say you have to be very careful that when an agency is appropriately coming and saying, you know what, we learned a lot of lessons. I think you should pay more attention to these five things and dig deeper on this stuff and really be attentive. When you say that to someone like the federal home loan bank system, you've just described people. Like you've probably described skill sets that you didn't have. Maybe you described, you know, workload that wasn't there before. So on the one hand, safety and soundness might dictate more attention, more people, more effort. And then you have this attention to cost. So I think it's a delicate balance for sure. The federal home loan bank system as a whole can cooperate. And I think we can get even better, deeper, faster on a lot of cool stuff without necessarily having to increase expenses um, by doing these centers for excellence and cooperating. But I think it is not just unrealistic, but it's dangerous to imagine we could cut ourselves by half during slow times because then when the busy time comes, we're not there to do it. I'll make one comment on executive comp. 
So these, like the very top people in each of the federal home loan banks, if you look at the, you know, the public filings with the SEC, you know, base comp, even for CEOs is almost always below a million. You know, these NEOs, the highly paid folks, if you look again at the disclosures, you know, on the lower end, you're talking two, three, 400,000. On the higher end, you're talking six, seven, 800,000. These federal home loan banks, I'll say this because I, I don't know if Michael's in a position where he can say this quite out loud. I'm an independent director, mm -hmm. right? And I, my job is to look out for the bank. This is talent that you're fending off hedge fund poachers, you're fending off private equity, you're fending off well-run banks who pay their CEOs two, three, eight, 25 times that, right? Like, like our, the federal home loan banks are a cool place to work because we have public interests. We're kind of the white knights. No one's the chump when we make money, right? It's like everyone wins. And that only gets you so far, though. <laughs> like, like, I can argue that you should take a pay cut to come and work for us. But at a certain point, I can't argue that you can't afford a house in San Francisco. That gets hard. So I would be very careful about doing more than we already do with exec comp. Public filings, co-op pressure to contain costs. There's a non-objection policy. The agency has proposed that they set exec comp. To my knowledge, there is no precedent in the federal government where a regulatory agency sets the executive compensation for a regulated entity that is privately capitalized and not in conservatorship. I'm not, I'm not sure that's the way to go. Maybe more public disclosure or something, but I don't think it's the way to go to have the government set the comp. Because then I guess they would set the comp for FDA supervised biotechs and we should set the comp for utilities, like, I don't know. I, I worry that that's a weird way to get at this. Hey, let's make sure we're paying people the right amount, not too much. Well, well, for, for a, a, a FDA, I think it's a government institution. Again, I, I think it's, it, I'm sure what you said is, is true, uh, Dan, but there, it's a small sample size of institutions that are uh, functionally private, but have an association with the government. There, you know, there's Fannie Mae, there's Ginnie Mae. Like there's Pfizer. Home, what, Pfizer, what? Pfizer is closely tied to the government at every step of their research phase, their approval, their distribution. A large portion of their customer base is funded by government funds. Like, I think that's a closer nexus. It would seem to me that the next step would be to set Pfizer's senior exec comp, right? Because because a third to two thirds of their revenue comes from the government. Their approvals of all their drugs come from the government. They are supervised by the government. They're, you know, so I, I'm not I'm not arguing that, by the way, mm -hmm. but I, I'm just saying it's we we are a government regulated entity, but we are completely privately capitalized. There's no government money <laughs> in, in that system, right? Nor is there an easy way for government money to show up, the GSE status notwithstanding. Jack, mm -hmm. let, me, let me come back to the, the, the question you raised in relation to the operations of the federal home loan banks. And one, I, I would just say that uh, we're efficiently run organizations for the complexity that we have to manage. Uh, but I would I would give you a, a, an analogy in relation to the federal home loan banks. We we provide as we provide certainly liquidity in all economic cycles, especially in times of crisis. But if take take the fire station example, if you have a fire station in your local community, it's critically important that that fire station is staffed and staffed appropriately for all types of crisis. If you use the analogy of saying, oh gee, we've never had a fire. We don't need the fire station anymore. You wouldn't cut all of the fire, the fire people that are supporting that community, because at the first time you have the emergency, where would they be? And so we staff the federal home loan banks to manage all economic cycles. So in times of, of crisis and you, when there's there's not a high demand, we still need to have the staff and resources available to be ready for the need when that when that comes about. We certainly saw that in March. So the you know the other piece too is do you see a, a large ramp up in resources at the same time and a large ramp up in expenses as advances go up? The short answer is no, you're not you're not seeing that. So we need to be we manage the the federal home loan banks very efficiently in, in that regard. You know, the, I, I do agree with with Dan that you know centers of excellence are important. There are examples of centers of excellence today in the federal home loan bank system where we do have centers of excellence. Certainly the Office of Finance issues then on behalf of the 11 federal home loan banks, certainly a center of excellence. We do have a mortgage partnership finance governing council where all 11 banks participate as part of that, which is part of our MPF program and AMA programs that acquired member asset programs that all of our 
uh, federal home loan banks participate. And these are where we purchase mortgage loans directly tied to the mission, purchase mortgage loans from our member institutions that originate loans. And we, we hold on balance sheet or, or sell to as a pass through to Fannie Mae or securitize through Jenny Mae. So there are, there are examples of centers of excellence today. I think we can expand upon the centers of excellence as we look into the future and, and look at ways in which we can generate more efficiencies. Uh, but we do a lot today already. So uh, these, these are things that we can continue to build on as we look ahead into the future. Mm. Thank you, Michael. Thank you, Dan. It's been a pleasure to hear both of your insights. Thank you for you know, being so generous with them as well as your time. And thank you everyone for watching. Thanks All for right. having us. Thanks, Jack. Forward Guidance, the program you just enjoyed, hopefully, can be viewed on YouTube at BlockWorks Macro or heard as a podcast on Apple Podcast and Spotify. Episodes are typically released on Apple and Spotify a few hours before they air on YouTube. Please leave a review on Apple Podcast if you feel so inclined.